right, happy Tuesday, everyone. Say go to Mayo. Hope you guys are staying safe out there. I'm Rendy Murphy, epidemiologist and um, director of disease surveillance at the Mobile County Health Department here to give you our, our summary of COVID-19 as it affects Mobile County. So just to start with our, our case count worldwide, 3.6 million confirmed cases with over 250,000 confirmed COVID deaths. In the United States, almost 1.2 million COVID cases with nearly 70,000. We're at 68,922 deaths in the United States. In Mobile this morning, the Alabama Department of Public Health um, data dashboard was reporting 8,120 cases of confirmed COVID-19 in Alabama residents with 310 of them succumbing to the disease. And in Mo Mobile County this morning, um, we're reporting 1,230 um, cases of COVID disease with 68 who have died from illness. So as you know, we are continuing to expand the information that we're providing to everyone. We, I, yesterday I read some stats that I um, committed to putting in today's report and we did that. Had a, couple of folks comment that we, we seem to be missing some math. So yes, in the, in the new table two with detail on those that have been hospitalized and died, we had not included the number of missing in several of categories. So those of you who are um, sticklers for you know things adding up, please accept our apologies and we have that information corrected now. So again, among 1,230 cases of COVID-19 disease in Mobile County residents, we're reporting on 161 that have been hospitalized during the course of their illness and 68 who have died from illness. We began reporting on the number of healthcare workers in that count. So 177 of our cases were known to be healthcare workers. That's around 14 and a half percent percent. Um, 91 were known to be employees at a long-term care facility or 7.4% and 184 or 15% residents of a long-term care facility. Again, reflecting that we have outbreaks going on in several long-term care facilities. For those people who were sick and are now no longer reporting symptoms, we rep that represents about 26.5% of our cases or 242 of the 1,230. So a little bit more information on those that have been hospitalized and who have died or who have died. So among those that are hospitalized, 60% of the, the patients who've been hospitalized with COVID disease were 65 and older and 26% between 50 and 64 years old. Most of them are female. This is reflective of our, our cases. 52% are female, 58% are African-American, and about 44% of those were in intensive care for some part of their stay in the hospital, and 24 of those required mechanical ventilation at some point during their hospital stay. We know that being admitted to intensive care and being on a mechanical ventilator are um, risk factors for severe outcomes. Um, they don't necessarily cause the, the disease to get worse. It's just um, sort of reflective of the acute respiratory distress syndrome that COVID-19 causes in people who are 65 and older or have underlying medical conditions. Among the 68 that have died, 75% of those were in the 65 and over category and 24% in the 50 to 24. I think we talked yesterday about the 135 year old that has died with COVID who had underlying conditions and disabilities. Among the, the 68 who died, we see a slight um, flip in the, in the sex category in that 57% of them are male this is fairly indicative um, on a larger scale of what some um, geriatric and sex and gender equality researchers have known for quite some time that sometimes men delay seeking treatment until sometimes they are um, you know, in crisis. 
So um, again, just sharing this information with you so that if you have family members who are in these categories, you can encourage them to pay closer attention to their health and their and complications of, of illness to try to seek medical attention um, as soon as possible when you experience complications. Among the 68 that have died, 53% of those were African American, 40% white, and most of them were hospitalized at the time of their death. We know that several long-term care facility residents have died in residence, and we are, we're continuing to tease out the information to make sure that we can continue to say that all of the, the folks that died had underlying um, medical conditions that made them more vulnerable to complications of COVID-19 disease. I, I've just about teased that out for everyone and hopefully I can include that in the report tomorrow. So we got a little nervous over the weekend when we had a spike in the number of cases reported on Friday as being 69. We know that about half of those came from one laboratory. We don't think that there has been any other um, biological explanation for that spike and we're pleased to see that for the past few days we have had back numbers of reported back to us in the you know less than 30 so on Saturday 27 on Sunday 26 and yesterday 26 new cases of COVID-19 reported to us I've had some requests to try to um, tease out our map a little bit more so that the downtown area can get some more visibility on um, the number of cases in that eastern part of the county where we have very small zip code um, areas so I'll work a little bit on that. All right on to the Q&A segment of our show. We have some media reports. First I want to just read one that was prepared by our um, inspection services program manager Brad Phillips. I think the question was working on a story blah 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 this is about shutting down businesses or you know the who has the authority to shut down a business or take away the license of a business that's refusing to comply with the state safer at home order um, or any local ordinances and so Brad put together a really thoughtful reply to this while Mobile County Health Department can move to suspend permits of establishments that are normally under our jurisdictional control, effective, effectively removing the ability for them to operate is for law enforcement to enforce. So that's that um, legal closure is a law enforcement um, responsibility, not a health department responsibility. And we also have no control over the issuance or revocation of a business license that is generally by the city or county. What we do is permit an establishment to serve a certain kind of food or beverage or to operate a pool or um, whirlpool, things of that nature. If we don't have the authority or ability to issue or revoke business licenses. And just to um, remind everyone that if someone intentionally violates the state health order, the Safer at Home, which was um, issued as an emergency rule, that that is punishable um, as a criminal misdemeanor. All right, so moving on from that. Someone was asking about um, some, you may have seen in the news, the, some, the sheriff in Baldwin County is saying that they're not going to enforce the governor's order. And the question to us was, given the proximity of of Baldwin County to Mobile County and the frequency of people going back and forth are we concerned that decisions could lead to more positive cases in Mobile County we know that that can happen of course there are, are you know the virus doesn't hop off at the border it will continue to travel back and forth I think that um, I'm not any more concerned about Baldwin County people coming here then I would be concerned if I lived in Baldwin County about people coming to my beaches so I think that um, you know we know that there is carriage of disease across um, county lines 
the last couple of outbreaks that I've been involved with in Mobile County, mostly coronavirus and, and also we're having a hepatitis A outbreak, it seems as if most of our cases are traveling from the west and coming through Mississippi and to Mobile more so than um, cases and tran transmission coming from the east and coming into Mobile. But that's just an anecdotal observation by an experienced epidemiologist. I don't have any fact to back that, any data to back that up. Qualitative data, not quantitative data. All right, here are some media questions. Some of these are quite complex and I'm not gonna be able to answer all of them. Can somebody answer why Mobile County has the largest number in the state? I can't answer that with all certainty. It likely is not a single cause. It likely is multifactorial. Um, we have a lot of outbreaks. We're still testing um, mostly people who are symptomatic. Uh, we have test, 10 testing sites out there now. We think that, that people who need to get tested have, have enough locations out there. Again, some of the testing sites are reporting um, you know, a lack of, of interest, at least on the weekend. So there are, are lots of things that are likely contributing to this and we'll, we are, we'll continue keeping a close eye on it. Lots of questions about how many people are getting tested. Um, I have said from the beginning that those data are so messy that I try not to spend too much time trying to make heads or tails of really messy data. That those numbers are reported daily on the Alabama Department of Public Health data dashboard. So if you want, if you're interested in day over day or week over week changes in that number, please pay attention to that website and grab those from there. Because again, um, I don't, I, I don't stake a lot of weight in that except to try to 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 get an, a feeling for about what percent of our population is receiving a test. There are some lawmakers and politicians that are trying to use a two percent of the population needs to be tested in May measure as a, something that they think about among many other things when they're talking about potentially reopening. So. Um, Stay tuned, you can check on the White House um, reopening um, plans for, for more information about that or um, check with the governor's office or the state health officer. Let's see. Someone asked a question about something a state senator said on the floor yesterday. Um, I, that statement is um, not anything that really I can, can comment on. This was about um, crisis standards of care and the use of ventilators when ventilators are in short supply. But really, we don't have to worry about that right now because ventilators are not in short supply and we have um, enough ventilators that we need right now for everyone who needs one can have it for as long as they need it. Um, someone asking me to comment on an outbreak at a apartment complex, which I cannot. Something about something the mayor said, which that goes back to the mayor. Of the 68 deaths in Mobile, do we know how many of those were residents in long-term health care? That's now in our daily report, and I just mentioned that. Do we have enough test kits for everyone to get it? It seems like we do, like I said, because over the weekend we had locations that were shutting down early because they didn't have anyone queued up to, to receive a test, so they closed up and, and went home for the day. Again, the, the 10 locations that we know of that are testing using the PCR test in Mobile County are on our um, public website at mchd.org. All right, here's some from Facebook. Are employees that work in nursing homes been tested for COVID? Are they required to continue to work or are they quarantined at home or work to the greatest extent possible? When someone is exposed or um, tests laboratory positive for COVID, we try to keep those people at home until they meet the criteria for lifting isolation. In some very critical situations where staffing is low and um, you know, we still have to maintain just, you know, we have to maintain healthcare, we may end up bringing a healthcare worker back into a healthcare setting who previously tested positive but is asymptomatic as long as they wear their mask and meet all the other CDC recommendations. So that is not a Randy Murphy decision. That is that is a CDC recommendation to thanks Mark. 
um, that that when we are in crisis contingency mode, which you know means we are low on PPE, low on testing, low on staff, high on the number of patients that are in isolation, that there are some preferences as to how you use staff that have previously tested positive for COVID. So Mark was saying that I mentioned about the 10 testing sites where the PCR testing is available. We get lots of questions about where can I get antibody testing and you'll have to call those sites and ask them because I don't know. We have not been supporting widespread testing using the antibody test because too little is known about false positives or false negatives or about what it might mean and everyone nationally you know, Centers for Disease Control is working with FDA, he's working with NIH, he's working with all the other um, scientific um, partners out there to try to figure out if there is a legitimate valid use of the antibody test. But right now, there are only a few that are FDA approved and they have to be performed in high complexity laboratories. So, um, you know, a pop-up clinic is not a high complexity laboratory. So if you are still curious about antibody test locations, sorry, but you'll have to, to contact those locations um, to ask. All right. Someone asking a question about organ donation if you um, die with COVID. And that's a good question, and I think I know the answer to it, but rather than comment on it today, I will do a little um, reading up on that since I did uh, several weeks ago and try to answer that one tomorrow or Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. Uh, let's see. Total cases from congregate settings. So I mentioned that today. The ones that we know are residents or workers of long-term care facilities. That's sort of the same thing as a congregate setting. There are other congregate settings like detention centers and group homes. Um, and things like that, but for the, for the most part, look at their report where it talks about the number of long-term care facility residents. Let's see. So someone making a recommendation that we test all nursing homes before they have a big outbreak. So I just wanna comment briefly on this because again, the PCR can give a false negative if it is used too soon. And generally you are PCR positive within two to five days of getting infected. So if I'm exposed and if I get the virus inside my body, there's a two to 14 day window before I might start, start exhibiting symptoms. So I, let's say I touch my mouth and I, I introduce the virus into my body, the virus will start to multiply. It takes a couple days for the virus to get to a high enough level to make me sick and to be detected by PCR. That's why we don't just do widespread testing with the PCR test because it can be a false negative. What we have done is to say, because we know we have asymptomatic infection, so we know that there are people testing PCR positive that are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. And because of this, we have started advising, and this is not just a Randy Murphy, this is a state of Alabama and a CDC recommendation, that depending on the local conditions, if a nursing home has a COVID positive staff or employee, we are recommending testing of most of the employees, regardless of whether or not they're symptomatic, so that we can get any asymptomatic employees out of that facility as quickly as possible. So again, um, we have you know very few tools in our toolbox with which to manage outbreaks and the crisis and the PCR test right now is the best thing we have for detection but the best thing we have for prevention is social isolation social distancing sorry um, isolation if you're sick hand hygiene cough etiquette physical distancing covering your face if you go out that is the the only prevention tool that we have in our toolbox right now because we don't have a, a vaccine and we don't have medicine to treat. The testing is important because we wanna get people who are spreading virus out of the public as quickly as possible so that they're not exposing people who are in our community who are vulnerable to severe complications and deaths. 
when we see report regarding zip codes, please share that info. So we are sharing info on zip codes. I'm not quite sure what that question's about. So if you're watching again today, please give us a little bit more information about your inquiry. Sometimes people don't ask a question on Facebook. They just make, it, make a rather lengthy statement. And someone was, was talking about being sick last fall and they, their, their flu was negative and their um, pneumococcal pneumonia was negative, but they had influenza-like illness. You know, could they have had COVID? Uh, probably not last fall, unless you had traveled to Wuhan, <laughs> uh, China. But, you know, there are other viruses out there besides flu that circulate and cause influenza-like illness, like enterovirus, parainfluenza, um, RSV, I forget what that one stands for, several other, there are about 10 or 12 viruses on the viral respiratory disease panel. And, um, and a flu test, depending on what test was, was used or not, the bedside flu test is not a very reliable test. So, sorry, I know you would probably really like to get an explanation for what made you sick, but that may, be, um, that may not be possible at this point. Are masks still required? So face coverings are not required for the general population. They are strongly recommended. Strongly recommended. Face masks and N95 masks are conserved for our healthcare providers and anyone working um, in, a, in a healthcare location. There are um, options for, you know, in the food establishments, there is no mandate to wear masks, but we are strongly recommending wearing of masks by any retailer or food establishment if you can tolerate it. Just to, again, try to protect those people who may have asymptomatic infection from spreading the virus unintentionally. Dental offices, yes, are being opened for some um, surgeries and other routine procedures. So um, check the state health order to see um, what services are being, are allowable by a dentist office. Someone else asking about a specific apartment complex that may have cases, and again, we don't release that information. That information is only made public if the facility, if the nursing home or assisted living facility or senior apartment um, facility decides to announce that. And someone um, claiming that we are not doing enough tests in the nursing homes. And I think that we are doing more testing in nursing homes than I thought we ever would. And we're getting pushback sometimes from, you know, the, because we've taken this approach, but we feel it's the right thing to do in a nursing home or a long term care facility that has a COVID positive test. We are doing everything we can to get the nursing homes first to um, build the capacity for testing so that they can quickly identify COVID if it hits their facility and then to test liberally um, patients and staff so that they can identify asymptomatic carriers of virus to try to mitigate um, the, the outbreak from the spread in their, in their community. I think we've actually sort of made it more difficult on the state public health lab because we are relying on them heavily to assist some of our nursing, our smaller facilities who really um, did not have the capacity for pulling specimens on site and we're trying to get them to do that. So I just wanna read maybe two more questions here. I think I have time. Yeah, okay. Um, is it okay for me to donate blood? This is really important because now that essential surgeries or non-essential surgeries rather and non-essential health procedures are, are starting again, um, we have been seeing a lot about the blood banks needing blood donors. So CDC has said that in healthcare settings across the U.S., donated blood is a life-saving essential part of caring for, for patients. The need for donated blood is constant and blood centers are open and in urgent need of donations. Encourage people who are well to continue to donate blood if they're able, even if they're practicing social distancing because of COVID-19. CDC is supporting blood centers by providing recommendations that will keep donors and sa staff safe. Examples of these include spacing donor chairs six feet apart, 
thoroughly adhering to environmental cleaning practices and encouraging donors to make donation appointments ahead of time. So please, if you have been a donor, a blood donor in the past, please continue that. And if you, if you feel like you are, are well and can help our community by being a new blood donor, please contact your local um, blood bank and talk with them about if you are eligible to donate blood and making an appointment to do that safety safely. All right. I want to one more, once more, um, read the information about the expanded symptoms and in information that we have received from from CDC. It's changed slightly, and I just want to make sure I, I let you know because again, we're asking folks who were in that 65 and older category or who have underlying medical conditions to pay very close attention to your health. And I want you to add these things to your daily list of observed of observed symptoms. So right now, if you you we consider you having a symptom, you may have a symptom of COVID if you have cough or if you have shortness of breath or difficulty breathing or you have at least two of these. Fever, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, and new loss of taste or, or smell. Several of these are new to the list. So I wanna make sure everyone jots these down and these are the ones that you need to self-observe for every day. Cough or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing or at least two of these. Fever, 100.4 or above, chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, new loss of taste or smell. Is that a question? One minute. One minute, okay. So with that, I'll end today. Remember on Wednesday, the Unified Command, so the, the Health Officer, Dr. Eichold, um, the Mayor and the County Commissioner will hold a joint press conference at Government Plaza, and that will be in lieu of our 2.30 update tomorrow. So we'll see you again on Thursday. Be well and stay safe.